Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 661 of the podcast and it is Sunday the 11th of December 2022 as I record this and I've just got in from my walk. Uh, It is the first snow day here in Bath uh, of the winter and British people really don't know what to do with snow, we just get very excited and (laughs) so we went for a a walk and uh, it was lovely. I've put pictures on uh, Instagram and Facebook at jfpenauthor. In today's show, I'm talking to first-time author Barnaby Jameson, who is a barrister here in the UK, a King's Counsel, specialising in anti-terrorism, and he recently released his first historical novel. Barnaby is very well connected in the literary world and considered doing a traditional publishing deal, but decided to go indie. And he talks about what he learned, what he will do better next time. Um, And a lot of people wanted to know more about the first time experience of self-publishing. And uh, it's very interesting also discussion on the value of intellectual property and why obviously Barnaby's a lawyer, so he understands this kind of thing, but very important for us to know about. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But yes, if you are self-publishing for the first time, remember you can get my successful self-publishing ebook. It is free everywhere, uh, including on my own store, creativepenbooks.com and also in audio and print. So um, everything should be answered in there. Right. So the interview with Barnaby is coming up soon. In publishing and book marketing news, quite a lot going on. So first of all, Draft2Digital can now distribute your catalogue to smash words. So uh, if you log into Draft2Digital, if you use it to publish or if you want to, there's now a button that says add all my books to smash words, which I went in and clicked very happily. And uh, what's so funny is I started out using smash words right back in the beginning. Mark Koch has been on the show lots. He was one of the first people I met sort of back in 2008, 2009. Uh, He was in Australia at the same time as me. And yeah, it's so lovely to see. Obviously, I had both uh, Mark and Kevin came on the show last year to talk about the Smashwords um, merger with draft to digital And so now it's all starting to come together. So what does this mean? Well, if you distribute either through draft to digital obviously, if you just go through Smashwords anyway, you can have your books in the Smashwords store. So this is a store that people from all over the world can access. Now, you might not know this depending on what country you're in, but many people can't buy books books of some of the more well-known platforms. Um, But Smashwords uh, is available to everyone everywhere. And that's always been part of their mission, I guess. Also, um, Smashwords uh, has authors writing genres that have (laughs) been banned by other platforms. So uh, there are lots of things. And what I found interesting about the press release is it says draft to digital is in the testing phase of implementing Smashwords proprietary erotica certification system. And this what this means is that it gives retailers greater confidence and control over the types of erotica they carry. Now, this is is great to know because Smashwords has always supported erotica authors. And uh, this will hopefully mean wider distribution, but also this certification system is great. I mean, we all want, (laughs) we want authors to be able to write things, but equally, we need some kind of protection but Smashwords has managed to, by putting in this certification system, to make it easier for both sides, I guess. And and that is is great. And so draft digital is now doing that too. If you, uh, so essentially it says millions of readers visit the Smashwords store from over 180 countries. It has six consecutive years of growth, bucking a larger industry-wide sales slump. The Smashwords store is on track to achieve its sixth consecutive year of sales growth. It also has an author-friendly refund policy discouraging fraud. So that's really cool. So yes, if you're on Draft Digital, you can now have your books in the Smashwords store and uh, advertise that as another platform where your books are sold. 
More good news uh, and coming in for AI audio. So, of course, I had uh, Ryan Dingler from Google Play Books on the show back in August 2022 in episode 642. We talked about the auto narration where you can use uh, brilliant AI voices to narrate your books. Well, they have just released what many people wanted, which is you can now use multiple narrator voices for your auto narrated audio books. So essentially, you can tag specific text and change the voice for those characters. Absolutely brilliant. I'm looking forward to playing with this. Um, Multi-narration can be used to emphasise dialogue, highlight different points of view in a non-fiction book, for example, or create a full cast audiobook production. I, I'm pretty excited about that. That's something that has been out of reach for many of us in terms of financially viable. Um, it's very, very hard to pay that many people. So full cast audio with AI narration interesting times indeed. Now, I would say, though, there's definitely a gap in the market for authors producing AI narrated audiobooks. So yes, it might be easy enough to just upload your work, but you still have to run it through. Uh, you have to listen to it all. You have to test it. You have to change some of the um, dialogue tags. You have to, and if you do this multicast, obviously there's still production involved. So I feel like part of the job of audiobook production now, if you're someone who's been working with this, is offering your services to authors to produce AI narrated books is still a thing. It's not just a case of press a, press a button output a finished book that doesn't need checking, testing and some uh, editing. So yeah, I do think that is an emerging role. Also with Google Play audiobooks, a French and German narrator options now available. Brilliant, because that's something that people wanted because uh, German, certainly lots of indies putting books into German and also in French. And they're rolling this out to now 20 countries, including Germany, France and South Africa. You can use Google Play Books auto narration if you are wide with your ebooks. Basically, the ebook is the is what they use to create the finished audiobook. So if you're in uh, if your ebooks are in KU, you cannot use this. But if your ebooks are wide uh, and on Google Play Books, you can use this. Very exciting. There were also three surveys out in the last week about author income. <laughs> now, all of these are of course a snapshot of authors, but they're still interesting to consider. The first one is from the Australian Society of Authors. I'm going to put links in the show notes if you want to read everything in detail. The Australian Society of Authors reported that Australian authors earn on average around 18,000 Aussie dollars, which is around 10,000 pounds or 12,000 US dollars per year. So that's uh, one statistic. Another one is the Create UK author earnings and contracts 2022 report came out, which noted the median and remember median average. These are not the same things. I think median is actually better. But it said the median for authors is £7,000. So less than Australia. I, this report also has a very dramatic sentence. It says, following this decline in earnings, there are serious questions over the future of writing as a profession, which I frankly is ridiculous. <laughs> Because they're essentially defining writing as a profession as a one very, very narrow definition around contracts with publishers. And I actually attended the launch of this survey at the Houses of Parliament in Westminster, London. This week, I met an earl from the House of Commons, amongst other people. But it was a very weird event because the focus was essentially doom and gloom and everything's awful. Um, but most of the audience was over 60 and there was no mention of self-publishing. There was no mention of the vibrant creative, independent author community. It was all about how awful things are for traditionally published authors and freelance writers. It was almost the opposite vibe to the indie author events that I have attended. But also, even if you watch 20 books to 50k on YouTube, you will get the vibe. And I don't know, I, it's very frustrating because I want, I really wanted to kind of stick my hand up and say, hey, guys, everyone, there's possibilities for you if you just embrace it. Uh, so it was it was kind of sad because I really wanted to open their eyes to the possibilities of what you can do. But yeah, it was. Um, I, this is why I wanted to report on it because I want you to read these surveys and I want you to make a decision as to where you want to be and what you want to do. Because to me, this is a choice. You get to choose your path now. Uh, there isn't only one choice. So please just educate yourself, understand what your choices mean. And yeah, things can be different. 
So anyway, back to the survey. It says, advances are becoming rarer with almost half of all authors never having received any such payment. Now, this is classic because, of course, I have never received any such payment as an advance. Oh, no, I say that. Uh, That's actually not true. I have received an advance for foreign rights contracts. But let's say in English. So, um, yeah, advances are not necessary in order to make a living with your writing, that's for sure. They also say, which I do agree with, copyright continues to be little understood and underutilised by authors. And I absolutely agree with that, because as much as I bash on about copyright and encourage people to learn about it. And authors like Christine Catherine Rush, Dean Wesley Smith, Orna Ross and the Alliance of Independent Authors have been trying to educate authors on this for many years. Many authors have not taken the time to learn about copyright, which is what we make our living from. (laughs) And in fact, Barnaby uh, Jameson in the interview later mentions that this is why he went as uh, the indie route, because he didn't want to sign away his valuable intellectual property rights, even as a first time author. And he saw that the contracts he was he was offered were just not good enough for what he valued his IP as. So please, please educate yourself around the importance of copyright and intellectual property. But uh, the UK and and Australian surveys said, both of them said, many authors rely on multiple sources of income to make ends meet. And they framed this as a bad thing. And this also annoyed me. You can tell I'm, I'm ranting about this, I know, but I just, I really want people to see that there's another way. Um, I've been talking about multiple streams of income for over a decade. And I just personally, I can't see why you wouldn't want multiple streams of income. I think it is absolutely crazy to only have one stream of income. And of course, I have a personal reason for this. Back in 2008, uh, 2007, 2008 was I had one stream of income. It was my job. And then the global financial crisis hit. I got laid off like many other people. And I did get another job very quickly. But the point is, everything ended on the day some other company decided to stop my income. And if you only have one stream of income, say one publisher or one company um, or whatever, you you are at risk. So to me, having multiple streams of income is a very good idea. And sure, if you traditionally publish, then having multiple publishers, multiple formats, if you're in KU, it's about having multiple series, again, multiple formats, not everything has to be exclusive. You can have multiple streams of income, however you do this. And if you have a day job, then awesome. That's when you build your writing business up on the side, as I did. I did five years of having my day job and building up this business. But I have, at this point, I have very, very many streams of income. Uh, it is it is not, this business is funded by lots of different things, including you wonderful patrons. Each of you is a stream of income because if someone stops and every month people stop um, supporting the show, which I completely understand, and then new people join. And to me, that's where our future lies. It's not just in one contract that provides all the money. And, and that's why these Um, reports are damaging because they seem to insist that that's the only way. So yes, those are the two traditionally published focusing reports, which are pretty depressing. Please have a look at those. But then take a look at the written word media report, which is called The Making of a Six-Figure Author, How Authors Evolve with Their Income. And that's at writtenwordmedia.com, links in the show notes. So essentially, they have a really good breakdown of the different levels of income that authors make. And this is a per month situation. So say under a thousand a month, a couple of thousand a month and and so on, up to 10,000 a month and then over 10,000 a month. And essentially, the bottom line is an author's income increases based on how many books they have in their backlist and how effective their marketing is. And most authors making over $10,000 a month, so a six figure income per year, have over 50 books. And To write this many books, you really need an indie author mindset and the freedom to write, publish and market how you like. Most traditionally published authors will never publish over 50 books, but there are increasing numbers of indies who do this. And it's really, I mean, if you you commit to it, a bit like Dan Padovona was talking about the week before last or whenever that was, uh, you know, it's a mindset shift. It's a, I create things. I love creating things. I love publishing things. I just love this. And yeah, as ever, I'm more excited about what's going on in the indie space and our potential options in 2023. Uh, I'm, yeah, personally, I'm more excited than ever. And 
why I hate these doom and gloom reports is that they take away the empowerment of the author. And I want you to be empowered with the knowledge you need and with the inspiration you need to get your books out there. So you do also need to spend time on marketing. And again, I think one of the issues with these traditional reports is that they're sort of like, oh, poor us. Traditional publishing is not doing enough marketing for our books. Therefore, it's their fault. But look, the reality is that marketing a book is a often a bigger challenge than writing because the writing a book yes it's a real challenge at the point when you're writing it but once it's done it's done and you've got a book you've got an intellectual property asset but the marketing of that book can be done for the rest of your life and in fact after you die uh, with your estate management so marketing doesn't stop and has to be incorporated into your author life. The writing might be one and done, but the marketing never stops. And every successful author, traditional and indie, will tell you they have to market their books. And I've had many traditionally published authors on this show. Claire McIntosh springs to mind. Even Tess Gerritsen, who's been published for year, many decades now, um, you know, very traditionally published, talked about marketing. So yeah, I just think the reality is that you have to do this. Yeah, authors, so talking about those who make six figures, have at least 45 books published, have 25 writing hours per week, have been publishing more than five years, spend more on editing and work with professional cover cover designers, and spend about 17 hours per week marketing. So that's just a little bit more time writing than marketing, but still, you could say that's sort of 40% of the time marketing. With online marketing the most effective and in-person events the least effective form of marketing. So please, enough ranting. I, you know how I feel about this. I want you to be empowered. I want you to make the money you want to make, but it is about the work we do. <laughs> basically. And I know it doesn't suit everyone. I absolutely acknowledge that. Some days it doesn't suit me either, but thus is the job. So check out those surveys and decide where you want to be in 2023. Then learn what you need to know and put it into action. And every single thing you need to know is out there in the world for free uh, on my podcast, on you know all the podcasts that are out there, the Alliance of Independent Authors blog, um, 20 Books to 50K, at the Facebook group, the YouTube channel, it's all out there. So yeah, we get to choose our adventure. In my personal update, I got my edits back from my editor for the pilgrimage book. So I'm in finishing energy mode there. I want to get the special edition print formatted with the extra colour pictures, the hardback, the flyleaf foil or whatever it is called so I can get a proof copy done and figure out the postage (laughs) so that then I can finalise my Kickstarter. So there's lots to do there. Uh, I'm also going to be narrating the audiobook over Christmas, sorting all the extras out. So all finishing energy fun. But as I said, I'm definitely doing a Kickstarter for that for my direct sales approach. I also decided to get back to a short story I've had noodling around for a while. It's got around 3000 words on it. And this is how I tend to write short stories stories I kind of uh, or in fact a lot of my projects my fiction projects all my projects actually I might start something noodle around with it and then I just don't feel ready this particular story is around a war photographer uh, a um, a sort of memoir I read a while back about around a war photographer and I just puzzled me so much that someone would love that job so much and also has aspects of my eye operation I had laser eye surgery a few years ago and so I think a lot about losing my eyesight Um, and so yeah Anyway, these two things are coming together in a story and I actually made a cover image on Mid Journey and then used Canva to put that into a sort of book cover format and I really love it. So I haven't shared it anywhere because I don't know, I just, I really love it. But lots of people playing with generative art but this one just nailed it and when I because I was noodling around with it with the doing pictures on mid journey and when this when I found this picture when I made this picture with mid journey I knew then I just had to finish this story mainly because I want you to see the cover (laughs) so this is an example of how these tools help us be more creative um but yeah I've got quite a lot of editing to do because and I still don't know how the story ends (laughs) which is a bit of a problem with a short story because the ending's quite important. But yeah, so that uh, I'm kind of playing with that. 
at the same time. Uh, and as ever, I am doing an end of year promotion, 33% off my ebooks, audiobooks and courses. Uh, so you can, if you buy direct, so at creativepenbooks.com, use 2022 at checkout and you'll get 33% off my ebooks and audiobooks, not print because of course they have other costs involved. But yes, 2022 links in the show notes. And if you go to thecreativepen.com forward slash learn, you can get 33% off my courses, including the AI assisted author, which may well be useful. Links in the show notes again. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments. Um, Christopher Hopper said, listening to the interview with Charlene Putney that just came out, listening to this podcast made me feel the same way as when I watched The Matrix for the first time. Amazed, energised and eager to create more art with new tools. I couldn't finish washing the dishes fast enough to go find out more about Leica, uh, which is fantastic to hear. And I guess I'm really happy because I've only heard good things from you all about the response to chat gpt uh to mid journey i have it's weird because a year ago it was very negative i was getting so much negativity and bad comments and and hate and a year later i am getting so many enthusiastic comments so for example jeff adams says chat gpt is amazing based on your prompt you mentioned in the show i gave it a blurb i've been struggling with and it came back with something much stronger there are tweaks and edits to make but now i can focus on improvements rather than wholesale rewriting the blurb i'll be giving chat gpt all my blurbs to see what can be improved And then Christina, which was lovely, said, I'm rather suspicious of AI and I am a bit of a Luddite by nature, but I'm blown away. I asked it to generate a book description for a novel and it came up with something similar, only better. Then I asked it to generate an outline for a nonfiction book I've been wanting to write for years. I just provided the title and it gave me so many ideas and solved the problem I've had, which is identifying the need for this book. Amazing. (laughs) So yes, and I've just had loads and loads and loads of comments like this. People saying it's like um, a virtual assistant to bounce ideas off. Um, I'm uh, Jessica says I'm giddily devising new things to try out with this tool. Um, This blows my mind. Um, Angela says this is like a writing buddy for my current project. So yeah, I mean it's it's really helping people create more, and that's the attitude I want us to have. Let's create more and more wonderful things and get rid of the average stuff and let it do the average stuff so we can do amazing stuff. So you can tweet me at the creative pen with a double N, send me pictures of where you're listening or comment about the show. You can email me joanna at the creative pen.com, leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So this episode is sponsored by Ingram Spark, which I use to print and distribute my self-published print books wide. Because with Ingram Spark, it's my content, but they help me do more with it. And just a little personal comment here. All these AI tools are helping us create more, but we still need to get those books out in the world. (laughs) And what's awesome is the tools we have, like Ingram Spark, help us get our books out there. Uh, And I have actually seen on my Twitter feed um, about people who have written books with ChatGPT, use Midjourney to create the artwork and publish them just over since in the last week since they've been created. So it is um, uh, children's books, particularly, which the Midjourney does incredible um, pictures for. Anyway, back into Ingram Spark. If you publish through Ingram Spark, you will have access to over 40,000 retailers, independent bookstores, libraries, schools and universities, chain bookstores and more across a global network of distributors, including bookstores like Foils, Blackwells and Waterstones in the UK, Bookshop.org, which has become very popular since the pandemic, Booktopia in Australia and New Zealand, Chapters Indigo in Canada, Walmart, Target and loads of independent bookstores in the USA. And of course, it means your book will be available to order, but you still have to drive demand. But since having my books on Ingram Spark, I've had many of you send me pictures of my print books in libraries throughout the world. I've had my books sold at book fairs, conventions and in physical stores like Blackwell's in Edinburgh, which was very exciting when we stumbled upon them one day. 
So you can choose to use returns, but it's not necessary. You can choose your discount percentage and that discount is necessary. That's how bookstores make a living. You can also do bulk ordering, for example, back of the room copies for live events, or if you work directly with schools or bookstores, and I have had several bookstores in the USA and universities, in fact, order directly through me. And uh, you can just order them on the Ingram site and get them sent. So if you want your books available for bookstores and libraries, schools and universities, go wide with your print books. It's your content. Do more with it. Head on over to ingramspark.com. And I have a special code you can use until the end of 2022. Use promotion code PEN, P-E-N-N, all caps, for one free book upload, print, ebook, or both, if uploaded at the same time. So uh, yes, all caps, P-E-N-N, check out. Say this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time as ever is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. You are all amazing. Thank you for supporting this show for years and months. You are all brilliant. And it keeps me going. It really does uh, on the days where I wonder if I'm making a difference anymore. So thanks to new and returning patrons this week. William Sizemore, Ingrid, Melanie Parkinson, Deanna Roy, Victoria L.K. Williams, Scott Kavanagh and Blake At. And I will be recording my Q&A for patrons only this week, uh, probably. <laughs> so get your questions in. And if you support the show, you will get the extra Q&A. And um, yeah, you really do get to ask whatever questions you like, because it's kind of a private thing. And uh, yeah, so support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Barnaby Jameson is an English barrister specialising in terrorism and counter-terrorism. His first novel is Codename Madeline, a historical espionage thriller. So welcome to the show, Barnaby. Thank you, Joanna. It's a great pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm excited to talk about this. So first up, you are a busy guy. You're a barrister with important cases. So what got you interested in writing fiction and why write a historical novel? Yes, I am quite a busy guy. My life is one of extremes. And so sometimes I'm probably the busiest man in the kingdom if I'm in the heat of a major terrorist case. But then I do, because I'm now a king's counsel, get breaks between cases. And so I can then find myself between cases, having a little bit of time, maybe to go to Greece, where I like to write, to have a bit of time to myself to do some some writing. So it's kind of in my life, it's feast or famine. Mm. And why a historical novel? Because I guess most people would say, oh, well, why don't you just write a terrorism thriller? Because that's what you know all about. Why historical? Yes, that's an entirely fair question. And maybe the terrorist blockbusters will come. But I think I'd have to hang up my wig first because I can't write them while I'm, I'm currently in practice. But I've always, in answer to your question, I've always been interested in history. I read history rather haphazardly at Cambridge, but it's probably the only subject that I showed any degree of interest in as a student. And I've got a particular interest in World War II because I come from a a post-war generation, but it's clearly a seismic event that I think we're still coming to terms with. And of course, it's moving now from living memory into the history books. I've got a a personal connection because my grandfather on my mother's side was an airman serving in Ethiopia in World War II and also as as an intelligence officer, moonlighting for something called the Special Operations Executive. And my book is inspired by an agent of the SOE. Interesting. So apart from that personal connection, how have you done the research? Because readers of historical fiction can be very finickety about what's what is exact. You're absolutely right. And when my book was edited, every single historical assertion or description was challenged at every stage. And you're right, historical fiction writers do not suffer fools gladly. I read the effectively the official history of the Special Operations Executive, written by an ex-serving SAS soldier during the war called MRD Foote, who's since died. And then I read a series of biographies of the various characters in the book whose stories I have fictionalized, but they are based 90% on, on real people. 
So your writing process. So I'm interested in this. I mean, obviously, as a barrister, you do a lot of writing as part of your job, but obviously writing fiction is quite different. So what did you learn about this different type of writing? How did you have to change things? One of the strange things about criminal work, which is the work that I do, is that it's probably more like fiction writing than any other part of the law, for the simple reason that in a criminal case, there is an opening speech by the prosecution, and then there are closing speeches from both sides. And a case is a little bit like a story. It's about an event that took place sometime in the past and is recreated in court, and the prosecution has to persuade the jury that what happened happened in a certain way. And the defense obviously have a job to try and dismantle that narrative. But as somebody that mainly prosecutes in quite big terrorist cases, it is more like writing a short novella. And so some of my opening speeches have been up to 25, 30,000 words. And in the neo-Nazi cases I've been prosecuting recently, there's a throwback to Nazi history. And I'm obviously writing about the Nazi period in my book. And so actually, in my case, my the writing in my work is actually more enmeshed with my fiction writing than perhaps would be the case if I was any other type of barrister. I guess that's, as you say, that's the story angle, but you're essentially, I guess, performing a monologue at at that point. Whereas in a novel, I think one of the hardest things for new writers is dialogue. So it's conversations between characters that seem real because often they're not in, in whole sentences and that kind of thing. So were there challenges in the actual writing of fiction that you particularly noticed? Yes. And dialogue is one that you rightly alight on. And again, a curious way, I I think my work has actually helped with dialogue because sometimes I have to look at lengthy interviews between the suspect and the police, which is sometimes just pages and pages of dialogue. It's questions and answers. And then in court, when I'm asking questions of a witness or, or of a defendant, that is a type of dialogue. And so I think one's ear for dialogue, even with all sorts of different individuals, expert witnesses, defendants, becomes quite sharp. But I think there is a bigger question in what you ask or what I interpret as something that I found difficult, which is finding your voice, basically, as a novelist, as opposed to a prosecutor. And I didn't find that at all easy. And just for me, it it just came with an awful lot of practice rereading and rewriting what I had written. And eventually, I I think I found my voice, but I suspect my readers will judge that for themselves. (laughs) Yeah. And also, I think it will emerge. I mean, when you were beginning your legal career, you might have had 10% of the voice you have now. And I feel like as you develop as if you carry on with fiction writing, which I know you are, then that will be something that also emerges. It's like a, a strength. Any kind of strength comes from practice and confidence that you build up. You can't help but build up over time, right? There's no way someone in year one of a legal career is as confident and good as someone in year 20, for example. <laughs> one would hope that that would be the case, Joanna. No, you're, you're absolutely right about that. It comes with confidence practice. And also, I I think it it comes down to the old fashioned idea that uh, unless you've done something for, I think it's 10,000 hours, you're not really going to master it. So I think it does take, as we all know, an enormous commitment. But when you find your feet and find your voice, it's wonderful, as, as you know. Yeah. And this is a really interesting discussion because I I know a lot of very smart people like yourself who are experts at writing essentially nonfiction. And they really struggle with almost this, the difficulty of switching into fiction because the skills are so different. And there's this almost a sort of a a blow to the ego as you realize there's so much you have to learn, even though you thought that you were an expert in some of these things. And I mean, how have you dealt with essentially becoming a beginner? Whereas in your career, you're just, you're the top of your career, basically, and you're kind of going to the bottom of a fiction ladder, which is super hard. It's really difficult. And I think that the process of writing is humbling. The process of writing and then showing it to other people, as in readers, is doubly or or triply humbling. And I had to slightly hold my breath over the summer because I published, as you know, under my own name. 
see how my, my writing was going to go down. And I, I have to say, it's been to some extent quite a nerve wracking process. But when I started to get the response that I've had from readers and bloggers and critics, I was able to let out a, a small sigh of relief. But it's very difficult going, as you say, like snakes and ladders, right the way down to the bottom rung. But I have found that on the sort of other side of the mountain, having now got my book out and published, it's really heartening and wonderful to see people actually enjoying my work, e e even though I am a rookie novelist, as, as you say. Mm. And as you said, you published under your own name. So this this is your name. And th I mean, that is a an interesting decision because, of course, if people Google you, you come up in different circumstances, I guess. So why did you make that decision to use your own name? Uh, I took that decision because I was comfortable with what I was writing, not in a sense interfering with my work. You mentioned a moment ago writing a, a terrorist thriller. I think if I was writing a thriller that was intimately connected with some of the cases that I'd done, then I think I would have had to have published under a different name. And I probably would have had to have, as I said, hung up my wig. But I think that the writing that I've done is sufficiently disassociated from my day-to-day -day job. But having said that, I have borrowed certain things from my work, as in one of the characters in the book is, is based on the barrister Francis Suttle, who was an SOE agent who was sent to Paris and ran one of the biggest SOE-backed resistance networks. He was a barrister who was half French and, and half English. And there are various scenes to do with Francis Suttle, where he's having dinner at Lincoln's Inn or he's at court at the Old Bailey, where I'm actually able to use my experience as a barrister to make that authentic. Uh, and I think something would be lost, frankly, if I published under the name of Joe Bloggs. Fair enough. It's a difficult decision. OK, so let's get into the publishing side, because you have a lot of connections in traditional media. You absolutely could have got a traditional publishing deal. So why did you decide to self-publish Codename Madeline? Thank you. I did have various publishing deals or offers that were made to me, and I was in the extremely fortunate position of having a choice. I had offers that were made to me through the traditional route, both through an agent and also through simply personal approach from me. And so I was looking at the various offers that I'd had, obviously very grateful for them. And there are enormous upsides of publishing traditionally, as you know, but there are also some quite significant downsides. The first, obviously, is that your rights go for a fairly small amount of money, given the amount of work that's gone into a book, but that's a, a common problem. But for me, there were two other factors which I had to take into account. The first was timing. Had I gone down the traditional route, the offers that I had meant that I, the book would not have come out until probably autumn 2024. And just in terms of my work, I had a juncture this year. This was the this was kind of the now or never moment for me. And so the timing was something that really pushed my consideration. And the other thing was this. I'm lucky enough to have a friend of mine called Olivia Williams, who's a great actor. She's just been playing Camilla in The Crown. And she basically volunteered or volunteered herself wisely or unwisely to become the narrator. And it was just talking to various people that I realized that having the book read by somebody of Olivia's stature was potentially quite valuable IP. And so to that extent, I was actually, I became actually quite cautious ab about handing over the rights for a, a paltry sum and actually hanging on to what was potentially some valuable IP. And so that really is what tipped me into the, the independent route at this stage. Mm, because, of course, traditional publishing contracts now include ebooks, audiobooks, and print. And I mean, most of them are not letting audiobooks go separately or ebooks go separately, right? You've put your finger on it, Joanna, and I was worried, deeply concerned ab about seeding my sort of my queen on the chessboard. And of course, once you've got an A-list actor has done one book, then there's a good chance that the else of her stature will read book two. I'm not going to give the name of the potential reader of book two, but it's somebody that we all would have heard of.
Mm. I love how you you've leveraged your contacts in such a great way to go the independent route. And I think that's brilliant. But just coming back to you said about valuable IP, so valuable intellectual property. And I mean, obviously, you're a lawyer, you understand these contracts and the value of these things, but many authors don't. So how would you advise new authors listening, people who have never been off for any money for their writing. And in fact, you hadn't been offered money, I guess, for your fiction before this. So how can people almost look ahead to the value of intellectual property when they're completely unproven? I think it's a very difficult question. And obviously, as a rookie writer, if you submit your work to an agent, an agent likes it, takes it to a publisher, 90% of you is going to be so thrilled that you're going to be published that that is going to be the main driver of your emotion. The fact is that somebody is, is going to pay you maybe, I don't know, a small number of thousands of pounds for the rights and will then publish your book. But of course, the contracts, as you've rightly observed, are stacked in favour of the publisher and against the author. I mean, that's just the way of the world. And I think what's changed now with the independent route is that sort of people in my position who are fortunate in having the choice of either traditional or independent are able to stand back and say, well, yes, I'd love to be published. And I'm so glad you, the traditional publisher, feel this is publishable, but I'm actually going to go about this in a different way. And I picked up from your book on, on book marketing One of the avenues open to you as an indie author, if you decide to write more than one book and you write a series, is that you do have the possibility, if it works out, of becoming, as it were, the next Joanna Penn. That is to say that the CEO of their own creative endeavor. And I think for me, certainly, that that is very exciting. And I've got more books in the pipeline, and I will review the position perhaps after book two or three and decide whether it's best to stay independent or whether it's best to hive some of the publications off for traditional printing. So I'm just going to sort of watch and see. But I think for somebody going into the profession, they have to ask themselves, I think, some hard questions. Are they going into it purely for the love of the writing and sod the money? Or are they thinking, I'm going into this because I'm doing it for the writing, but I'm also thinking about a commercial career here. And if it's the latter, then I think that there's a strong argument for being quite reluctant to cede all of your IP to a traditional publisher for a song. I love that. I love CEO of your creative endeavor. I think that's yeah. wonderful. And yeah. and certainly that's, I guess that's the route I've chosen. And um, so I know you wanted the book to be the best it could be, and you were absolutely concerned with quality. And the book does stand next to a traditionally published book anywhere. So what publishing services did you use and any lessons learned or tips for authors who were just starting out self-publishing? Yes, I think the first thing to say is to underscore what you've just said, which is that I think an independently published book should be able to sit on a bookshelf at the same standard of or better than a traditionally published book. I mean, that was the test that I I set for myself. And the way that I I went about it was, first of all, I, I had it edited within an inch of its life. I went to the Ink Academy in London which is a a wonderful service. It does creative writing courses, but it also has on its books some very good editors. And somebody called Marina Kemp, who heads up the Ink Academy, she took a look at some samples of chapters and she said, right, I know just the editor who I think is going to enjoy this book and you'll enjoy working with him. And I will always be thankful to Marina because she put me together with a guy called Phil Connor. And he edited my book and and he edited it just so unbelievably well. And the piece of writing he he produced at at, at the end, which was a sort of critique of of the book, was almost publishable in in its own right. It was so perceptive and brilliant. And he's one of the, the people at the beginning of my book, along with you, to whom a dedication is made, at least there's a mention. And so it went to him. It then goes through all the other editing processes. And at that stage, I got in touch with somebody called John Bond, who I think you know. Yes, he's been on the show a couple of times. Yeah, from White Fox. He's the CEO of White Fox, which produces 
I think, very sort of high-end, independently published books. I mean, they are absolutely beautiful books. And my experience of White Fox is, is that they have extremely exacting criteria, perhaps even more exacting than some publishers that I've come across. One has to go through a quality threshold in order to publish through White Fox, because as John said to me, I'm putting my name along with yours, as it were, on the spine of the book. It's White Fox publishing Barnaby Jameson. But that turned out to be a bit of a, a bit of a marriage made in heaven. There are other barristers who publish through White Fox. One is Bob Marshall Andrews, KC, and the other is somebody called Nigel Lithman, KC, who's a judge who's just written a book about being a judge. And so there was already a relationship between barristers and judges and, and White Fox. And I found dealing with White Fox extremely careful, great attention to detail. And the book went out, as you know, for any number of different edits after the, the first edit. But then going back to what you said about publishing and my own name, I also sent it to members of my profession, in particular Im Imran Mahmood, who's written You Don't Know Me, which has become a Netflix series, just to make sure that you know he was content, along with all the other editors, that this was the right thing to do under my own name. And so it had input from any number of different individuals as well as writers who are friends who also read the manuscript very generously. Mm, so it's a real collaborative process. Yeah. And as you said, I, th I think you were more rigorous than it. I mean, in a traditional publishing house will be rigorous, but they also have a ton of other authors to work with <laughs> and yes. they have a process and you go in the queue. But what you did is you worked with, like you said, so many different editors and so many different people to help you. I think you did an incredible job there. So did White Fox do your ebook and your print book? Yes, basically, they did everything. And they helped me sort out the audiobook as well. I mean, that there you've got to sort of tie in with the studio, but they were deeply involved in, in, in getting the studio and everything else organized. I mean, Olivia herself was a great help with that. But as you say, it was basically one big collaboration involving a lot of extremely generous people with their time and, and as people to help me with the print, the ebook and the audiobook. Mm. So was there anything that surprised you or that you were like, oh, my goodness, I just did not realise that or anything that, that you learned that was unexpected or surprising? I think having read How to Market a Book, I had a reasonable grip on, on the importance of marketing. But I have to say, in, in the last few months, I have really felt how much attention really needs to go into pushing your book forward, pushing it into, into the limelight at every opportunity. I'm particularly lucky because I'm a barrister, but there are other barrister writers within the profession who have put their shoulder to the wheel and have helped me. And so I've had a review from the secret barrister who I think you would have come across. Mm, and he's, yeah, he's yeah. famous tweeted, in the UK. <laughs> exactly. He's t tweeted about my book. Somebody called Rob Rinder, otherwise known as Judge Rinder. He's a barrister. He's also did a bit for the back of my book. He put a, a bit on the blurb. Um, and Imran Mahmood, who I mentioned a moment ago, they've really helped me with the marketing of the book. I have found Twitter, I know it's going through some throws at the moment, but I have found Twitter to be a very benign and effective forum, actually, for putting my book out into the world. On the plus side, the one thing that I think has surprised me to my delight are some of the book bloggers, many of them habituate the Twitter sphere. The people that did my publicity, Midas, they they sent me on a, I think what they call it, a blog tour. And so apart from getting reviews from established authors like Giles Foden, I also had the book go on a blog tour. And it was when the reviews started coming in from the bloggers that I, I really was quite overwhelmed. Um, I was completely blown away that, that they they obviously really felt very deeply about the book. And I had words like, mesmerizing and even the m word which i'm almost too shy to mention but somebody did, did use the, the the word masterpiece which I, I couldn't really believe but it was really the emotion and passion of the bloggers i found absolutely extraordinary and of course one blogger will quite often pass the book on to an, another blogger and so some of the people have sort of come on the bandwagon and that has produced a little bit of a, of a head of steam and just today a, a blogger gave away two copies of my book as 
part of a competition that that he was running. And I was only too happy to, to help him out. Well, you've done some great things. I mean, calling in favours and using relationships, that's just a core piece of the initial stage of marketing. You mentioned social media there. You mentioned book blogging and a PR team that you use. Now, I know people listening are like, you know, but Barnaby, earlier you mentioned about the importance of valuable IP. Like, how is your profit and loss looking? You don't have to give us numbers. But it seems like for a book one, this is an investment and this is not necessarily a profit making venture as yet. Yes, uh, that's a fair comment. I mean, looking at the numbers, I haven't yet recouped the outlay, but I'm not a million miles away. And I think a lot of that actually is driven by the sales of the audio book more than anything else, you know, from a profit point of view is is, is the main re- revenue driver. And so it is an investment. And I think for any rookie writers out there, Obviously, I, I wouldn't advise it against selling the farm to go down the route that I've done. I've obviously put some investment into this, but I'm quietly confident I would say that in time, um, I will find myself moving from the red into the black. And there was just one other comment that I was going to make, if I may, uh, lest I forget, which is just going back to social media and Twitter, but it taps into marketing generally. But the one thing that I've found in the last few weeks people have really responded to very well are little short films which I've put onto my um, Twitter feed. And I've got a talented young filmmaker called Gabriel da Costa or Gabriel Seely da Costa, who's just put together a two minute film, which is at the prologue of my book being read. And you can hear Olivia Williams's voice. And I've also got my technical guru, Um, and Mentor, which is my 12-year-old boy, Fero, who's also done some compilation films of Olivia Williams, which again, you can see on my Twitter feed. There seems to be something about a sort of two-minute film that people can't quite resist watching. And I'm at the moment, I've I've now set up a, a TikTok account, although it's a fairly young TikTok account. And again, I think if authors have got any expertise in this area, putting together short films, or they know whiz kids who can, That, to me, I I would say, has been a very valuable part of the marketing. And just looking on Mm. Twitter today, more than 200 views of of a short film that's only been up for a, a few days, which is quite a lot for Twitter. Yeah, so it's so great to hear about all the different things you're doing. And of course, you said you're almost in the black, but you're also planning a series. So tell us about the series and what will you do differently next time? And I guess, how are you going to build on what you've started? Well, thank you. The series is called The Resistance Series. And part of that was actually going to this very good editor, Phil, and talking to various people. And at the beginning, my book one was giant. And then I'd realized I'd really written two or, or even three books. And so it's been spread out into a series of potentially six or eight books. And so with each book, what I'm doing is taking one particular SOE agent as the protagonist. You may meet them briefly in book one, and then they become the protagonist of book two. You may then meet the protagonist of book two briefly, and then they become the protagonist of book three. Each title will have the word codename in the title. And book two, which is being written at the moment, is called Codename God Given. I think in terms of doing things differently, I'm going to have a winter launch next year as opposed to a a summer launch only because I just think it'll just be a little bit different. Um, I think I will really up my game in terms of short films. And so what I would like to do is to have a, a short film going out on my Twitter feed maybe every week when the book first comes out. Or what I'm thinking of doing at the moment is taking one character from the book and then making a short film about them. And then week two, you get an introduction to another character. And as I said, there's something about the 90 second film that people sort of can't resist. And so I think really it's just trying to build on some of the small successes that I've had this year, building my relationship for very passionate book bloggers and then building my followers on social media. You know, I haven't at the moment got a mass following because I didn't really start this until I started to take my books out. But I would hope 
that my following, like yours, will grow as as I grow as a writer. I'd like to beef up my 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 website and rejig it so that potential readers can sign up. And I've got a bit of work to do with my web designer. But I think in answer to your question, it's really building on the foundations that I've laid this year. Mm. So have you got an email list? Have you been building an email list from that book one? The, the answer is, I have to slap myself on the wrist here, Joanna. That's one part of my website that I've actually got to organise. And so what I will have as of next week is a, a system whereby if you sign up onto the reading list, you basically get a copy of your own of the prologue. But I've just got to organise that with my web designer. So that's one thing that I'm, I'm a little bit behind on. And so I hope that by next year, I will have a reading list at that's been built from from, from now, effectively. Mm. Well, I, I, I can actually hear some people are quite relieved that you haven't done everything perfectly. <laughs> because, <laughs> because I mean, sometimes, I mean, people feel like there's so much to do. There is so much to do. Even if you're working with outsourced services, there's still, you have to manage everything, right? With your job and your family and all of this. So the fact that you managed to not do everything is completely normal. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for saying that, Joanna. And, and by no means have I done everything perfect. And as you rightly observe, I mean, you're learning all the time. I didn't know what Amazon KDP was to, to the very beginning. I didn't know anything. And in a sense, it's a relief to, to know how little I did know had I, had I um, at the time realized how little I knew. Who knows what I would have done? But I think if you're willing, as you say, to learn and just to go out into the world, I found that the response has been positive because I think people respect the fact and admire the fact that you're putting yourself out there. Your book is an expression of your soul in the pages of a book. And I think if you've got the courage to do that, people do respond. I mean, you know this as an established author. And when they respond very viscerally, it makes everything worthwhile. And I did just want to ask, I mean, you work in a very traditional industry, but you've mentioned your wig and if a lot of people are listening outside of the UK and uh, I'll have to get a picture of you and put it on the show notes with, with all your gear on. But I mean, it's a very traditional industry and people respect tradition. So what's been the response? You mentioned there that you have had a lot of great responses and friends helping, but have people, I don't know, looked down on you at all for self-publishing or do you feel like the so-called stigma is is just not there anymore? I don't think uh, it's really occurred to people, if that's the honest answer. I mean, I, I think that unless somebody really knows about books, if a reader is somebody you know from the publishing world, the first thing they'll do is, is really turn to the first page and see who the publisher is. But I think most readers, if they see a well-produced book and some blurb on the back and some reviews, I don't think that they actually... Uh, are really that concerned ab about which route you took it to market. And I think probably that's what's changed within the publishing industry. And I think that the traditional publishers, to some extent, should be looking over their shoulders because people like me coming along, they don't have two years to wait around for their book to go through the, the system. And so we're, in a sense, jumping the queue. And I think it's, in a way, quite healthy for the traditional publishing industry to realise that there is another way open for authors like me. And I think competition is, is good. Absolutely. And then a final question, you mentioned earlier being the CEO of your own creative endeavour and going into the profession. So where are you going to be in 10 years time? Is, is this the way you're going? Are you going to hang up your wig and become a full time writer? Is, is that in the future? Well, I think the, the truthful answer is I'm not quite sure yet. What I would say is that as a counter-terrorist prosecutor, you're living a life of such extremes that it's not really something you, you can do forever. And most of my colleagues have moved on into the judicial space or some other space because it's really not a sustainable life. I mean, it's a very re rewarding one. But yeah, in, in 10 years' time, I think if things go to plan and I've got six or eight books out by that stage and I have a miniature creative empire, I think I'd be very happy with that. And I take an enormous feather out of your cap and a leaf out of your book. And if I could emulate even a tiny amount of what you've done in this space, I think I'd be very, very happy and rewarded. Oh, you're very sweet. <laughs> so where can people find you and Codename Madeline and everything you do online? 
Okay, probably the first port of call is going to be um, barnabyjameson.com. It sometimes comes out as barnabyjamesonwriter.com. Uh, and that will give you a pointer exactly where to go. There's a button you can click for Amazon and other outlets as well. But the main internet outlets are Amazon.com and Apple. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Barnaby. That was great. No, thank you, Joanna. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I hope you enjoyed the discussion with Barnaby and that it gave you some insight into why you might decide to go indie and some ideas for what to do if you're new to self-publishing. And remember, if you need the basics, you can get my successful self-publishing ebook for free on all ebook platforms and also in audio and print. You can also get it from my store, creativepenbooks.com. And remember, you can get 33% off at checkout using the code 20222022. And you can also get that at thecreativepen.com forward slash learn for my courses. Links in the show notes. So coming up next week, Jane Friedman and I discuss some of the recent changes in publishing and interesting news items, including the Department of Justice, uh, Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster case, which had some incredible insights into traditional publishing, as well as how acquisitions of these type of thing um, impact authors, because Simon & Schuster is being sold, um, why backlist sales are important, and how to use paid newsletters as part of your multiple streams of income. So happy writing. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.